Welcome to Ask Dr. Mingle, the Q&A series from Mingle Health, answering your questions about quality programs and the transition to value-based care. My name is Hadley Taylor, a MIPS Quality Program Consultant. I'll be hosting this episode along with Dr. Dan Mingle, founder and CEO of Mingle Health. Hello, Dr. Mingle. Good morning, Hadley, and good day to all of you tuning in. It's great to see you again. I am Dr. Dan Mingle, and I'm here to answer your questions the best of my ability. Great. Let's dive right in. Our first question today comes from Nicole. Nicole says, our organization runs multiple ACOs and has a few provider groups that are still Medicare fee-for-service and liable for MIPS. We are wondering whether it would be better to fold them into the existing ACOs, keep them in traditional MIPS, or utilize the new MVPs. Do you have any advice for us? Great question, Nicole. I think I can lead you through the pertinent questions, but I need to dig in more specifically to answer the questions for these specific practices. Um, and we could do that with uh, with an analysis primarily of your claims data um, on an engagement with Mingle. You need to consider both the cost of reporting and the effect that provider additions might have on your ACO performance. It's not hard to roll these providers into one, of more, one or more of your existing ACOs, and it won't have an enormous effect on the cost of reporting. Most vendors are charging by the Medicare patient or by the unique provider as represented by tax ID NPI. Discounts on the cost of reporting tend to increase as the number of providers or covered lives increases, and therefore would it would tend to be relatively contained as you as you increase the size of those groups. However, the addition of the providers may affect the performance of the ACO and the money the ACO might be inclined to collect or not collect uh, that may exceed the the cost of reporting. There are four ways that your that a, the addition of providers can affect the existing ACOs. First is in patient count. The more patients with the same quality and cost performance will translate to a higher shared savings. Although the same dynamic occurs with losses. If you expect your ACO to be liable for a shared loss, the, the addition of these provider patients will exacerbate those losses. The second effect is on cost performance. If these providers are managing to a lower overall cost, they will improve your shared savings loss profile. And of course, the reverse is also true. Third, what are they going to do to the group's quality performance? The quality submission will tend to be an average of the quality performance of all the participating providers contributing to the data. If their data is inaccessible, it could threaten your ACO compliance with data completeness criteria and invalidate the quality submission by not meeting that data completeness minimum. By pulling the overall quality performance Upward or downward, if they're performing significantly better than your average or they're performing significantly lower than your average, they can decrease or increase your ability to collect on the earned savings. That is to say, as you already know, their cost performance is, is going to determine what your uh, shared savings or shared losses are, but their quality performance determines what percentage of your shared losses you owe or percentage of your shared uh, savings you will collect. And finally, there will be effect, an effect of your institutional cost of care. Um, if your ACO is performing well, it means you're managing the, po the patient population well. Uh, you're calling them in for the right services, you're providing the right services when they see you, you are referring them down lines where, they, uh, where the costs are contained and people who are thinking along the same terms. So if you bring in additional providers that expand your market where you haven't explored all of these issues already, um, you might be sending people down consultative paths that are inherently more expensive than the ones that you have in your, uh, in your current ACO. So there will be a cost to build the equivalent infrastructure of service uh, in a community if you're adding a community with those added providers. If you keep these providers fee-for-service, not in the ACO, 
MIPS versus MVPs is an easier decision. I think for today, particularly since this is the first, since 2023 is the first year that MVPs are offered, you'd be, I think you'd be uh, well advised even not to use them yet. But I, I would encourage everyone to practice. They're close enough to traditional MIPS that it makes sense to start getting used to how they work. And I suggest that this time you should do both a traditional MIPS submission for these providers and choose one MVP to build your familiarity with the process. If you've built both, you should submit both. You won't be punished for that. Your group will be assigned the best of the two composite scores of your either your traditional MIP submission or your MVP submission. I initially thought you might want to choose multiple MVPs and submit um, submit the best of those, but I'm reminded that Medicare requires you to register your group or subgroup for the MVP in advance. So you can't prepare, prepare multiple ones uh, and submit those multiple ones for your entire group, which is, I think, where the main um, strategic benefit occurs in, in this short run, in these early years of MVPs. Thanks, Nicole. Great. Thank you. Our next two questions today are going to come from Georgina. Her first one says, it still doesn't seem to me like we're making a difference in value of care. Should we continue to comply with the quality payment program requirement? Looking back at how this is developed, with the Physician Quality Reporting Initiative, that was PQRI, that started in 2007, Medicare introduced introduced quality reporting and incentives based on that reporting. The name of the program was later changed to the Physician Quality Reporting System, that's PQRS, and changed from pay for reporting system to a penalty for not reporting system. Cost of care analysis was in, introduced shortly after that, enrolled into the value-based modifier program. Close to the same time that Medicare started introducing models of Medicare ACO that ultimately became the, the Medicare Shared Savings Program and introduced rewards for high-value care and penalties for low-value care within that program. With the introduction of the Quality Payment Program, that's the QPP in 2017, the Medicare Shared Savings Program, MSSP, became one facet called the first pathway of the QPP, one of many alternative payment models which, which are in that first pathway. The Physician Quality Reporting System became the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS, in what they called, what Medicare calls the second pathway of the QPP. Now, so far, I have not seen definitive data nor anecdotal evidence of great progress to higher value care based on any of these programs. What I see is still high costs and problems with quality and distribution. Inex inaccessibility of care, inequity of care, delays of care, high costs, health insurance costs and, and health care costs both growing faster than, than overall inflation. U.S. health care costs are still the highest per capita in the world. Now, Medicare annually assesses the performance of the health care system and tries to estimate the effect that its programs like the QPP has on that system. And Medicare has generated enough evidence in that annual analysis to remain committed. Uh, they, they've identified enough evidence of improvement uh, or at least containment of the growth of cost to conclude that those, pro those programs are worth continuing. With those commitments intact, we can expect the merit-based incentive system to remain if merely because Medicare is using it to train providers in value measurement and payment and move them to al alternative payment models, particularly the um, Medicare Shared Savings Program or MSSP. Many of you saw or heard about the article in the Journal of American Medical Association, that's JAMA, in December of 2022, where lead author Amelia Bond PhD with her team wrote MIP scores were are inconsistently related to performance on process and outcomes measures. 
they looked at data from the uh, 2019 um, performance year as it was uh, displayed in the Physician Compare website. Uh, and now with a new name, I think Medicare is now calling that care compare and comparing that to actual uh, uh, claims and other performance uh, data, the accessible data uh, from that particular year of performance. They concluded overall, it did not seem to make a consistent difference in in the performance of, uh, of providers uh, participating that year. But, you know, I think we're on the right track. The data is always going to be behind reality, so it's hard to conclude based on 2022, uh, 2022 article that the MIP system in 2023 or the quality payment program system in 2023 is not worth pursuing. Look, looking at Bond's article in, in JAMA, the flow of healthcare work in real time that, that becomes documentation and collection, analysis and submission of the data to Medicare through study by the by their study design and writing and publica publication of that data to us through a, a, through a journal like uh, JAMA. There's at least a five-year gap between the performance year and our examining, examining and drawing conclusions from the resultant data. That's five years in a program that's changing dramatic, dramatically, evolving every year, and a system that took three years off during the COVID public health emergency. It's simply too early to tell if it's making a difference. I also observe the quality payment program is teaching us about the difference between process and outcome measures in healthcare. With that lesson in mind, it's apparent to me looking at the comp composite MIP score or the calculated savings and quality of MSSP that cost is actually one of the primary outcomes we are trying to affect. But quality is a process measure. It's better measuring of our ability to capture and report data that it measures more than the qualities of care. So I think it's, it's too early to tell. And also uh, in the next question, I'll describe more of the details of the measurement and why it's, why it's important to keep measuring. Thanks, Regina. Excellent answer. She also has another question today. If it seems like these programs have yet to make an impact, should we lobby hard for their end? I think that the only choice worse than continuing to participate is to end the program. We can do better than we are. The quality payment program is pushing us in the right direction, but by itself, it will not give us the high value healthcare system we desire. We have to measure cost, make sense of it, and take action to lower it. We can't lower costs without monitoring quality, else we save money by denying care to our most expensive patients. We have to measure quality. It's only by measuring it that we, we can improve it, know that we're doing what we're intending to do. So measuring cost and quality is necessary, but it is insufficient to improve our healthcare system. Beginning and ending our attention to cost and quality on the limits, the beginning and end of the quality payment program will never be enough. The quality payment program will not do it for us. If all we do is to react to the changing rules of the QPP, we will more likely add costs and perhaps gain quality in some domains at the expense of quality reduction in others. The quality payment program and related programs provide tools for committed healthcare practitioners to improve value if they're interested. Combine commitment, with measurement, and we might just get where we want to go. There are three parts to the task that is right in front of us. First, add quality to care, and second, to remove costs. Relating to both is the third factor, we can't change what we don't measure. We can't change what we don't measure. I believe that. And that puts my support behind the quality payment program. If you say, but the quality payment program is faulty and hasn't achieved those goals, I agree. It hasn't, but it does not reduce my resolve. I can still use the tools that the quality payment program provides to do a better job. 
And I must contribute to a steady evolution of the QBP and related programmatic rules to drive the change we desire. I'm envious. The tools I wished for for decades in my own practice are available now to you youngsters. Everything is coming into place that we can use to build a high value healthcare system if we have the will to do so. Keys that I'll talk about more specifically uh, in, in future sessions, the important tools available to us. We can use the EHR to take cost out of care, primarily by reducing the cost of documentation. We can use the EHR to add evidence-based quality to care. We need a measurement system that accommodates not just four or six measures, that's four or six, I think I got that right, but monitors 35,000 known evidence-based rules for healthcare. We need to use emerging models of prospective payment to pull us out of the rut of face-to-face office-based care and permit us to innovate the delivery of care and be truly patient-centric. I think that there are only three things that you should be doing. I think there are only three things that I should be talking to you about. This may be a commitment, this may be a limitation, we'll see in coming sessions. But I think those three things, you can probably say them with me now, taking cost out of healthcare, adding value to healthcare, and using measurement to improve cost and quality, that is value of healthcare. Thanks, Georgina. Thank you to Nicole and Georgina for the great questions. And of course, thank you, Dr. Mingle. Thank you, Nicole and Georgina, for all the great questions. I want to be helpful and I want this to be useful to you. Don't hesitate to correct me or supplement my answers. Share your experience, ask your questions. We can be smarter together. 